We start with breaking news. That's former President Donald Trump as he returned to Trump Tower after a jury found him guilty on 34 counts of falsifying business records. He is now a convicted felon. That could change if his appeal uh, overturns the conviction, but as of now, he is a convicted felon and free on bail until sentencing July 11th. That is the legal situation. Those are the facts. On the political side, sentencing comes four days before the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. It will be galvanizing for Republicans. Trump sent out this fundraising email just after his conviction, and it did not take long for his campaign website to crash from so many people trying to give money. And there is anecdotal evidence that big money donors are now lining up behind Donald Trump to show their support. Here is the former president as he left court today. This was a rigged, disgraceful trial. But the real verdict is going to be November 5th by the people. And they know what happened here, and everybody knows what happened here. You have a sore respect, DA, and the whole thing. We didn't do a thing wrong. I'm a very innocent man. All right, President Biden has not commented directly. He's not at the White House. He's on vacation. But a spokesman said they respect the rule of law. And that will become particularly meaningful next week when the president's son, Hunter, goes on trial. With us now, New York criminal defense attorney Michael Desharo, who's been with us throughout the trial. Tom Dupree, former deputy assistant attorney general under George W. Bush. And George Will, senior political contributor, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist. Gentlemen, we appreciate you all being here. Michael, just nuts and bolts here. Um, you've got between now and July 11th for uh, th this idea of a, a sentencing that will occur and the appeals process to go on simultaneously. How does that look? Well, first of all, Trump has to go to report to probation because there has to be a probation report, uh, a sentencing report that has to be given to the court. Well, Trump will be allowed to make uh, statements, which I'm sure he will. Then the court gets the sentencing report and the the uh, prosecution makes a recommendation as to sentencing and then the judge pronounces sentence on July 11th and then as soon as he pronounces sentence the his defense lawyer will file an appeal will file notice of appeal within 30 days of the sentence and the appeal process starts which i imagine will be expedited but you still need time to give the lawyers time to file the briefs so that is what that's legally what's happening. Also, if there's a probation sentence, that sentence can be transferred to Florida because Trump is a Florida resident. And we have left out. I don't want to say the elephant in the room, but maybe the handcuffs or orange jumpsuit in the room. The idea that Donald Trump would be sent on July 11th to prison. I think you find that unlikely. I find it highly unlikely that Judge right. Merchant. We'll do that. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's the, the, the best way to say it. Uh, back here uh, in studio with George Will, 11 a.m. press conference tomorrow with Donald Trump. Uh, the lighting will be better uh, than it was in the hallway. The sound will be better. Is he flanked behind him by the who's who of the Republican Party, the Veep Stakes candidates, Speaker Mike Johnson and the rest? I don't know. I rather doubt it, actually, because I think he has a much more savvy and professional political operation right this year than he had four years ago. And I would expect that uh, if the professionals in his ranks have their way, he will be sober. He will actually read from the script. We won't have one of these stream of semi-consciousness riffs of his. And he will make some, uh, he, he is able to make some salient points. The beginning of which would be this. We constantly say he's been convicted guilty of 34 felonies. He's actually been convicted of one misdemeanor chopped into 34 little items, one misdemeanor on which the statute of limitations expired years ago, connected to a federal law that he's not empowered to enforce, he, Mr. Bragg. That's, the, in my judgment, an accurate description of it. Tom, from a legal standpoint, this may be the only trial of Donald Trump that happens out of the four indictments against him. And we're already seeing it may be backfiring on Democrats. 
Well, I think it is a safe bet. I would say it is a certainty that this is the only trial that's going to go before the election. And okay. to the point about backfiring, I mean, yes, you know, we see in the numbers every time there's another, you know, downturn for Trump in the courts, he uses it to his advantage to raise more money, get more supporters. And he, look, he plays the grievance card like a master. And I have no doubt that tomorrow morning when he comes out, he's going to be loaded for bear. I expect he will be beating the drum of the, the corrupt judge, the corrupt proceedings, the disgrace, all of that. Not powerful legal arguments necessarily. But he's playing to a different court. He's playing to the court of public opinion. Michael, uh, speaking to the court of public opinion, there's a court of public opinion in New York. We listened to Alvin Bragg for a while. Uh, I did my job. I did my job. I did my job as if somehow he upheld uh, lady justice and truth and goodness uh, and propriety in New York City. Um, Am I wrong to think there's a lot of New Yorkers who are going to be making the comparisons to the resources committed to going after Donald Trump versus how Alvin Bragg treats pretty violent and career criminals in New York City? I think you're correct, William. Just get the first question, my first question would be, how much money did we spend as a city? I know the court officers, some of them are friends of mine, have they've been working overtime. We're talking about tens of millions of dollars that have, that have been spent on this prosecution. And we still have cases where people are being assaulted in the streets. So Mr. Bragg said today that he did his job. In this case, the prosecution succeeded. But in many other cases, he's failed. So I imagine a lot of New Yorkers have a lot of questions about how these resources are being spent. Well, and he didn't fail because he failed in court. He failed because he chose to not prosecute. I think there's a there's probably a distinction uh, to be made there. George, we heard Donald Trump say a couple of times that the real verdict is November 5th, uh, when 150 million jurors, I think to use your term, uh, will render their verdict. Maybe it is my own sort of sphere and ecosystem, but I am seeing an enormous number of people who say, I never supported Donald Trump or I don't like Donald Trump, but now I do because of this verdict, as opposed to the number of people going, I always loved Donald Trump, but now that he is a convicted felon, I have had enough. I I imagine uh, Group A is larger than Group B. What, the, what, what either group will be six days from now, six weeks from now, it's hard to say. But this t- partly depends on how fast and convincingly the appeals process goes forward. Because once it dawns on people that this is a contingent uh, judgment, it's in the subjunctive mood, it won't be over until it's over, uh, then we're gonna, people are going to sit back and, and r- relax a little bit and say, well... Let's let this play out. And since this is the only one of the four cases against him, this is a pretty thin read on which, it seems to me, for the Democrats to to base a re-election campaign. Tom, do you think people really, as complicated as the law is, not to be too trite about it, but it becomes much more for average Americans, even for a lot of lawyers, an emotional decision of, do you think you don't like Donald Trump or Donald Trump does bad things rather than did he tell people to falsify invoices to cover up a payment that was made to his attorney that was then in turn made to a woman that he may or may not have had sex with in the way to try and corruptly influence a election of which he was a candidate dot dot dot. You put that perfectly. And and look, yes, I mean, I think it is a, a salient fact and an indisputable fact that the way Americans generally perceive these trial proceedings, the way they filtered the evidence as it came in, they viewed it through their own political prisms. Uh, it's no secret. The Democrats were praising the prosecutors throughout, say this was an impeccably tried case. They nailed Trump on this. They nailed Trump on that. And of course, the Trump partisans saw it completely differently. They did see this as a rigged proceeding. They did see this as a sham. They did think Michael Cohen exploded the prosecutor's case. So I think that people perceive everything in this day and age, and even the evidence that comes into court and should be viewed and under objective, neutral standard of law through a partisan lens. Michael, real quick, I never want to question a jury. I learned that a long time ago. But you think about 34 counts uh, times 12 jurors. They deliberated for about 11 hours. That gives each juror about a minute and a half uh, to discuss each one of the individual counts. Are we to believe that this was something other than an emotional decision? And to that point, um, so much, as you pointed out, was going to rely on Michael Cohen, the former president's fixer, and his credibility. You said it was a devastating cross-examination. What happened to happen other than the jury 
hating Donald Trump to convict him based on Michael Cohen's, an admitted perjurer's testimony. It could very well have been an emotional reaction to the political situation that we're in. We're not going to know that until the jurors speak. They haven't spoken yet. I imagine some of them are going to be writing books or columns or appearing on television to explain. Uh, but the real test is coming, which is the appeal. All right. Um, you said you said it, not me. Uh, the books and television interviews uh, of jurors. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I think a couple of you are sticking around throughout the hour um, as news develops. Michael, thank you. Uh, George, Tom as well. Live pictures at Mar-a-Lago where Trump supporters have been gathering since the news broke at 5 p.m. That's looking out to Mar-a-Lago. We call ourselves the fairest show on television. Well, no, we do. Have that up. We are in uncharted territory now. Got a question for you. If we look at New York City, how big is the headline on the New York Times going to be tomorrow morning? With you at my side, we will demolish the deep state. We will expel the warmongers from our government. We will drive out the globalists. We will cast out the communists, Marxists, and fascists. We will throw off the sick political class that hates our country. We will rout the fake news media, and we will liberate America from these villains once and for all. All right, a video Donald Trump just posted to his social media account. It appears what they did was took a rally speech of his, because you can hear the applause, and then they put it on top of video of him walking in black and white, obviously prepared and uh, ready for this moment, words he has said before. Uh, Donald Trump also said that this is a sad day, and he marks a day, this is the day. For the first time in 247 years, a former president was convicted of a crime and tried for 34 felony counts. There's never been a felon who's ran for president, let alone been the clear favorite. 67% of voters say a guilty verdict won't affect who they vote for. 17% say is less likely to vote for Trump because of it, 15% more likely. So it kind of becomes a wash very difficult to poll what people are going to do based on a hypothetical. So we wait for a week or two for these numbers to sink in. With us now, News Nation senior political contributor George Will, also Sean Wu, former federal prosecutor, Department of Justice uh, official, senior official in the Clinton administration. Good to see both of you gentlemen. Um, it's interesting what we're hearing from the White House. President Biden's on vacation. Uh, perhaps he'll go out and get ice cream in a few days or over the weekend, and people will shout questions at him, but he hasn't responded. Live pictures of the White House where they have responded. We respect the rule of law. Uh, that was Ian Sims, uh, who's a uh, spokesman there. This isn't the only politically sensitive trial, Jan Wu, uh, coming up. It is Hunter Biden that goes on trial uh, next, next week. No one is above the law, but no one is below the law. Are we now at a point where political actors on both sides have to be worried that they have now become targets legally of their political enemies? Well, I don't think that they have to be worried about being targets of their political enemies. Um, in just the way that this is so historic, it's never happened in two centuries, I think that goes to show how difficult it is for a um, prosecution to occur of somebody at that level of power. There's a lot of norms that have to be walked through, a lot of institutional hesitation to do that as well. So I don't think that this really opens the floodgate. No question it's precedent setting, no question it's historical, but I don't think it really signals that it's much easier to do that in the future. Well, that's a good point. Uh, I guess the counter argument would be once the norms are destroyed, then it's a lot easier to do it the second time. Um, versus the first. There'd probably be a couple of analogies to put in um, on that. But George, as we look back through the nation's history, it's easy to look forward. Let's look backwards for a second. For as divided as America was during the Civil War, the Vietnam protests, um, and at its founding, was this type of political prosecution ever considered? No, lawfare is something I think new at this point. We haven't used the criminal justice system in this way to cripple a, a viable, to say no more, candidate for the presidency. But look, political prophecy here is optional folly. This country listened to the Access Hollywood tapes and not tape and, and elected Donald Trump president. 
So trying to tickle the coming consequences out of this is hard to do. It does seem to me that what he should do now is come out and say, I've been convicted of misdemeanors inflated into a felony, and the felony is that I tried to influence a federal election in which I was a candidate, which is sort of what candidates do. Was part of the problem, you think, and I've heard this, that federal prosecutors passed on these charges because they thought it was very intangible and difficult to get to. Is there a feeling in the legal community that while Donald Trump may have done some really bad things, this, is, this isn't even getting Al Capone on tax evasion. This is getting Al Capone on how he kept his own business records uh, to follow out the analogy. Which would probably be tax evasion for Al Capone. <laughs> uh, I think that the question of why the DOJ had passed on this in Southern District of New York a little bit cloaked in mystery. I think there is a strong feeling that they should not have passed on it. But the fact that they did, I don't think affects whether the Manhattan DA's office should have passed on it because of that. I mean, theoretically, the way it works is you call them as you see them. If you think you have a case, then you bring the case. And I do think that they were hesitant to bring the case, obviously. Pomerantz, the first Manhattan DA, decided not to do this one. Bragg initially decided not to do it. Maybe he was studying it more carefully. Uh, but I do feel people have not been necessarily jumping at the gun to bring the case because it's a lot of pressure to bring it. George, we look forward just in terms of the political idea here. There's going to be a rally sometime in the next, what, three days. Um, there's most likely going to be a bunch of Republicans who are going to show up with them. They all showed up um, at court. Joe Biden is in the opposite position, perhaps. He's at his beach house in Delaware. What does he do? <laughs> Alison Krauss in the Union Station has a song. You say the most when you say nothing at all. Maybe it'd be a good time for reticence to take over. Doesn't often happen in our business, but uh, what cubit of understanding or helpfulness can the president add here? You know, of all the things I thought we were going to enter in today's show, Allison Krauss and Union Station um, was, not, was not on my list. It's a great song, though. Um, and say nothing at all is something Donald Trump is incapable of doing. So it is a, uh, a contrast for sure. Good to see you. Good Thank you, you, sir. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, in a statement, the Biden-Harris campaign told supporters that, in a sense, this decision won't change anything come November. They say they have to beat Trump at the ballot box, and there are 159 days until the jurors of America render their verdict. An outspoken American juror, Geraldo Rivera, is with us next. Trump on True Social, 6 o'clock this evening, so an hour and a half ago, echoed what he said outside of court. I am a very innocent man, and it's okay. I'm fighting for our country. I'm fighting for our Constitution. Our whole country is being rigged right now. News Nation D.C. correspondent Kelly Meyer outside the courthouse. Trump visits its next on July 11th. He holds a press conference in New York tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern. Kelly, uh, if he follows what he's saying on social media, what his campaign is saying, um, it will be more of I'm fighting for you, so they're coming after me, and... Donate money, please. Exactly. And that's what he's been saying as he came out of court here tonight. Uh, what he said in his statement that this is, quote, rigged, uh, that he is an innocent man and he's fighting on behalf of the country. That is looking like what we're going to hear at his press conference that he just posted about tomorrow morning at Trump Tower, 11 a.m. Beyond that, we don't know where he will be next. We know that he was eager, even saying today that he wanted to get back out on the campaign trail. Now he can, but we don't know what's next on his schedule beyond that press conference tomorrow. Uh, same for President. President Biden, um, we know tomorrow he's going to be at the White House hosting the Kansas City Chiefs. After that, what's his next campaign event? We're seeing both sides really fundraising off of this. I just saw a note from the DCCC also fundraising off of this. The, um, the Trump campaign, as you mentioned, uh, shutting down the website for Win Red uh, with the amount of people going there to donate. It will be interesting to see how much he raises within that 24 hours after this verdict was reached, Leland. Uh, the sounds behind you, New York getting back to normal after the trial. It only took them, what, two hours? <laughs> that is not related to the trial. That is just banned practice. But just, yes, things that's are just banned practice in New York. 
New York City. All right, Kelly Meyer, <laughs> thank you very much. Geraldo Rivera, News Nation correspondent at large, award winning journalist. Hey, um, with us, Geraldo, you are a New Yorker in uh, every sense of the word. Your hometown paper, the New York Times, uh, does the headline Trump convicted go all the way across the front page, or is there a couple of other headlines there? It's pretty, uh, it's pretty significant. Uh, how, how big? I don't uh, know techno technologically. I don't know the font size. But I would use the one uh, uh, just before atomic war declared. Uh, this is a huge deal. Uh, I had two quick reactions. The second one, let me give you the second one first. The second one was, oh, my God, they believed everything Michael Cohen, the greatest liar of all time, testified to. The first uh, uh, reaction, though, was this is a gut punch. Uh, this uh, was a nightmare uh, that uh, unfolded only in New York. Only in New York could this have happened. Uh, really, uh, I, I believe that uh, you cannot in any way minimize or be measured about this. This is a huge deal. We now have a convicted felon uh, who was president of the United States, who is the presumptive nominee of one of our great political parties, uh, now uh, uh, facing sentencing two weeks after the first presidential debate. Uh, this is uh, really breathtaking. This is a gut punch, uh, Leela. Yeah, it's, I think, a gut punch to the country. Um, it's a sad day, no matter who you support. Um, that, that we've gotten um, to this point. Um, you're also a lawyer, and I appreciated the Michael Cohen um, reference, um, the idea that you believe anything that comes out of Michael Cohen's mouth is just beyond me. But put that aside for a second. Um, from, from the Democratic standpoint, Joe Biden's going to be on the debate stage uh, June 27th, so about two weeks before sentencing. Um, does he call Donald Trump a convicted felon on the debate stage? Well, one thing we know for sure, they won't say uh, uh, to Biden, or as they said to Hillary in 2016, lock her up. If there's a, a lock, her, lock her up, it's a lock him up. Uh, and uh, it's something that is uh, plausible, although unlikely in uh, the former president Donald Trump's case. Uh, this, this is something that I believe that uh, it is impossible for Joe Biden not to uh, wrap his arms around. Uh, you know, it's not enough to just say this proves no one is uh, above the law. Uh, you know, this is not a time for uh, rhetoric. Uh, the, the former President Trump will come out firing tomorrow, I believe. Uh, he'll talk about a rigged jury. He'll talk yep. about a Democrat uh, DA. He'll talk about uh, Democrats, uh, 12 uh, angry men, uh, all Democrats, uh, he'll say. I'm not, I don't know that to be the fact, but uh, uh, forgive I, me, I think forgive this me for looking down. A much uh, we more already know part, significant. We already know part of the reaction from the New York Times. I'll see if they can take my shot full. It's an illustration on the New York Times website of Trump, uh, the back of Trump's head with what they've sort of drawn in as uh, jail bars uh, there. So that's how uh, the New York Times handling it. Geraldo, Donald Trump, who you know well, you covered for a long time, he defies political gravity every time. Democrats thought they had him. The press thought they had him going all the way back to 2015. Every time we all, and you and I were oftentimes on the same side of this, saying, well, this is it. Trump's, Trump's jumped the shark. Um, this, is, this is the end. And it wasn't. Four indictments. He went up in the polls every time. He gets convicted and his fundraising website crashes because so many people are giving him money. Are Democrats going to come to rue this day? Well, I, I, I'd rather be holding the Democrats' hand right now than uh, than the former president's hand uh, right now. This is uh, really uh, this is very very disconcerting from Trump's point of view. Remember, uh, this is a married man who is accused of having an affair with a porn star 18 years ago. 18 years ago, the past has come calling, and now is uh, unsettling and upsetting his uh, his run for uh, re-election or uh, you know. Uh, uh, being president, uh, being voted president again. Uh, the, one thing I believe is absolutely certain. Trump and Biden will agree that only the voters can decide now. There's going to be all kinds of noise. There's going to be all kinds of discourse, uh, discord. Uh, there's going to be a conflict. There's going to be anger. There's going to be division. There's going to be a hyper partisan politics. Yeah, look, in, in uh, the Biden campaign already put out a statement saying... Out. Yeah, the Biden campaign put out that statement, right, saying that only the 
only the voters can decide at the ballot box. You used to be a man about town in New York City. You used to hang out with Donald Trump. You knew everybody there. And there's an irony of two men talking about this. But I'm old enough to remember through all the issues that Bill Clinton had with women. Um, and you covered them. I covered them. Actually, I didn't cover them. It was before my time. But I knew about them. You covered them. Um, you think about the 60 Minutes interview uh, during uh, the New Hampshire primary season. Um, Hillary Clinton was next to Bill Clinton the whole time, all the way through, standing next to him, supporting him. Are we going to see Melania again with Donald Trump uh, in a political setting anytime soon? I, I don't know them as a married couple well enough to give you an insider's point of view. I can tell you as a, as a reporter and as an observer of, uh, of Mr. and Mrs. Trump, President and Mrs. Trump, she has really been very uh, temperate uh, in terms of uh, her, her messaging and very prudent in terms of her appearances. Remember, they didn't pull out the Melania card until after the Access Hollywood tape uh, really put his campaign on, uh, you know, uh, hanging by a thread. Uh, then she came forward and she said it was just locker room talk. And just that one statement from Melania kind of calmed things down and kept Trump in the game. Can she pull that miracle off again? Uh, can she make that big a difference again? Uh, I don't know. And I, I think it is of note. Uh, no Ivanka today, no Melania today. Uh, I, they, they really, and the president seemed, a former president seemed very upset uh, going into the morning. Uh, to, to remember, he, he said yesterday about Mother Teresa couldn't beat these charges. There was a reason that there, there was always the danger, even though the feds did not bring this case, even though other agencies did not bring this case, even though this case is probably the weakest and the lamest of all the cases pending against uh, President Trump, former President Trump. This is the one they brought. And there was always the peril. There was always the danger that technically speaking, they could thread the needle here. They could get a conviction on this case, maybe not all 34 counts. I thought that this was one count and a misdemeanor. And I, I believe the appellate court will see it my way eventually. I think this has zero chance of surviving appeal. I was, it was over. It's interesting. We've got both you a, and George Will agreeing on the same thing here. Um, and well, then, I got to run. But, but George cover. Will made the, made the point. Um, you say it best when you say nothing at all. Melania and Ivanka not being there says an awful lot. Melania and Ivanka being at a rally uh, with Donald Trump this weekend would say an enormous amount without saying anything at all. Geraldo, thanks for the perspective. True. It's good to see you. Okay, buddy. You too. All right. all right. Any way you slice it. And we know this because Alvin Bragg basically said this in the beginning when he was running for office. Bragg's case begins and ends with politics. The man ran on getting the former president. Does that play into the appeals process? Also, who gets more fired up by the pictures you're seeing right there? Well, not by the test pattern, just by Donald Trump being convicted of a crime. Republican voters or Democratic voters? See when we come back. 34 counts. Donald Trump did what he does every morning and evening. He walked out to the cameras assembled in the hallway of a dingy New York City courthouse and called the trial about his business records keeping nothing more than a political witch hunt. This was a rigged decision right from day one with a conflicted judge who should have never been allowed to try this case, never. And we will fight for our Constitution. This is long from over. All right, with us now, News Nation contributor, host of the Sean Spicer Show, Sean Spicer, and Democratic strategist, co-founder of Run Women Run, Laura Fink. Nice to see both of you. Thank you. Uh, Sean, take us inside Trump world, right? They're raising so much money right now. The website crashed. He is the topic of every news, both broadcast and network news channels, topic bars. Every front page of every newspaper across America will have him on it. Every website will have him on it. No one likes to be convicted of a crime, but are they kind of secretly like, okay, this, this could actually work out pretty well for us? Yeah, I'd agree with you. I mean, no one wants to be convicted because it's, you know, now your entire future, at least short-term-wise, is in the hands of Judge Mershon, who Trump's very clear 
is conflicted and doesn't like him. So I, I wouldn't want my future in a guy's hands like that. Uh, that being said, to your point, politically speaking, this is going to be a huge win for Donald Trump, both financially. I expect them to raise millions of dollars tonight. The site is back up, by the way. Um, but secondly, I think that for a lot of Republicans, and I talk to them all the time, that might that have been traditional Republicans, mainstream Republicans, that may have had problems with Donald Trump every time there's another effort like this, taking him off the ballot, now this, it pushes them into his corner. And they go, you know, I wasn't with them, but man, they're out to get him. I got to be with them. This is strengthening the resolve. Like Leland, I just want to be clear, whether it's Pennsylvania or Virginia, no one doesn't know who these candidates are. Biden's been in office for half a century. Trump's been everywhere for the last 10, 15 years, but even before he was a candidate. There's very few undecided people in this electorate. What there are, are unmotivated people, people who might not want to have voted. What this did is really push people into Trump's corner uh, who might not otherwise have been. I, I, I expect actually to see a bump in the polls. Not huge, because again, there's not a huge amount. Yeah, no, but look, I think you have to wonder whether it's going to be people going from unlikely voters or registered into the likely right. voter category all of a right. sudden. So, Those were so, the voters who were missed in 2016. That, I want to bring Laura in real quick, though. Laura, how do Democrats play this? Specifically, how does Team Biden play this so they don't look like they're gloating but can somehow figure out how to capitalize on it and blunt what Sean just talked about? Well, you know, to, to Sean's point, this is a story. It's news story. It's just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. That That is what's going to be on the newspaper. So the Biden team doesn't have to spin this. This is It is what it is. Have you and talked to one person who was either a Trump supporter or Trump skeptical in the past three hours or four hours since the verdict came down and said, you know what, Laura, I never really liked Joe Biden. I was OK with Donald Trump. But now that Trump is a convicted felon, I'm not voting for Donald Trump, and I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. Well, I haven't been calling persuadable voters on the break. But have you heard, have you heard from any friends? <laughs> uh, you know, what I will go to is the data, and the data shows that 25% of voters that said that they would reconsider, let's talk about who those are. Those are Trump-curious voters, many of whom voted for Biden in 2020. So the, the, the sort of ed electoral advantage here is that these are younger voters. These are tend to be voters of color, more likely than not. Um, and they, they, like I said, they tend to, they have voted, tend to have voted for Biden. Biden in 2020. So this is about Biden can gathering those voters up. They may be thinking about Trump, but this conviction really voting for a convicted felon might throw them back into the Biden. Or make them make them question again. Fair, fair enough. Sean, how does Donald Trump, when he comes out tomorrow at 11 o'clock and then he holds a rally sometime this weekend somewhere, because that's what Donald Trump will do. How does he persuade people? Yes, I'm being uh, persecuted. Yes, I'm the victim of a political prosecution. He's going to say all those things. But how does he assuage people of the fear that Laura just talked about or the feeling of people of, for God's sakes, like we've had enough of the crazy, of the mean tweets and of the kind of behavior that involves porn stars and payoffs that we don't want in the White House? Well, first, let me let me go back to what I said. I, I don't think that many people are looking around after basically 10 years of Donald Trump being in the political mainstream, obviously reality star before that. So they've known him. But he's been in the political mainstream bloodstream, if you will, for 10 years. No one woke up today and said, gosh, I didn't know that about Trump. I didn't know. I mean, all of this is so baked in to what people believe uh, is happening. I go back to the front page story of Politico yesterday, where one of the Democratic operatives said, if this is a referendum on four years of Joe Biden versus, or 3.5 years of Joe Biden versus four years of Trump, we lose every day and twice on Sunday. This is going to be a, a question of whether or not we stick to the issues. And so, to your question, here's what I would say to Donald Trump. One, I'm glad get we're finally to getting to the answer to my question. Well, but it's important to have the context. Um, so, number one, the more that you can remind people about the policies, the better, because I agree with the Democrat who said that. We win on that. But number two, and this is where he can't go over the top, for people who are out there who might not have tuned in to every minute of this, and it wasn't televised, so you had to watch it through the lens of reporters, he needs to get to the specifics of why this case, the conflict of the judge, and not just saying it, but explaining to people that Judge Mershon made contributions. His daughter is literally 
literally going to make millions of dollars tonight representing people like Judge Marchand. Brad Smith, the Sean, former chairman leave of the FTC, was I not allowed just say to testify. That the more Donald Trump makes it about the judge and his grievances, the less he's talking about the grievances of the American people. I see, Laura. Preach. Not, you know, they're, they're, oh, Preach. Well, a one-word one answer. You will definitely be invited back, uh, and you get to go first next time because Sean filibustered this, uh, this interview. Sean, good to see you. Laura, thank you very much. Pleasure. All right. Any way you slice it, Alvin Bragg's case against Donald Trump begins and ends with politics. It did. We're going to get to the law next. What does the appeals for Donald Trump look like? And how do you talk about appeals during the Republican National Convention? Live pictures of Trump Tower. What's Donald Trump thinking up on that penthouse floor when we come back? Live pictures of Trump Tower at 7.53 Eastern. Donald Trump headed back there after his conviction on 34 counts of mishandling his books, falsifying his books, it was. News Nation Now anchor Connell McShane was outside the courthouse as it all went down. And there's an irony, right, Connell, that the news conference tomorrow at 11 a.m. is in the exact same spot where Donald Trump announced he was running for president. Back in 2015, coming down the escalator, yeah, you're right. There was a time that I used to spend every Tuesday at Trump Tower. I think that was the 2016 campaign. And he would win a primary, and then he'd come back to uh, Trump Tower and hold a news conference in that, in that atrium, and apparently he's going to do it again tomorrow. You know, the context I would give from down here to this, I was thinking about it, Leland, over the last few minutes, you and I were on the air together when this verdict came down. Um, seems like a long time ago already. Seems like we're already moving on from that already. We're already moving forward to talk about what the impact is on a presidential race, what the former president is going to say at a news conference tomorrow. But when it happened for a few minutes or maybe a few hours, it seemed like one of the biggest stories we were ever going to cover. Here you go. You have a former president of the United States currently running for president who's now a convicted felon. But then within almost no time, it turned into just another night in New York City. I'm telling you, the security that was so tight you could barely move around is now breaking down. The traffic is moving again. For some reason, there's a marching band playing down the street right now in Foley Square. I really don't know why that's happening. But the point is, we've moved on already, and that's what we yeah. do here. And there's something to that that's really, really interesting, given what we've just all witnessed together. Yeah, and there's a great promise in that, right? That uh, nothing's ever as bad as it seems, and sometimes things aren't as good as they seem. Uh, this too shall pass, I think, uh, is the Hebrew saying. Connell, thank you. We know you'll be on station tomorrow uh, for uh, the news conference and all it entails. Thank you, my friend. Good to see you. Great work out there. Here it is, Trump guilty on all counts. One can almost hear the champagne bottle popping. I don't know about that. I don't know where that, why that, was, that was in the prompter. Sometimes I'll just read whatever they put in there. Uh, I thought we were going to put up the headline from the New York Times, Trump guilty on all counts. And it does go all the way across uh, the website. And we can imagine it's going to go all the way across the newspaper tomorrow. Uh, Chen Wu, good to see you back. Tom Dupree, good to see you back as well. Uh, the one thing you guys both are is accomplished lawyers and well-paid and well-sought-after by clients who are in trouble. Um, we'll put that live picture, Shenwu, of the Trump Tower back up. If you're up there in the penthouse apartment with Donald Trump, he's your client, what are you telling him tonight? Don't worry, we'll appeal, and you need to pay my retainer now. <laughs> <laughs> and did, you, did his retainer just double? Right, exactly. Well, all right, counselor. Not, not, not bad advice, I guess. I would probably put it a little differently, though. I guess what I would probably say is, look, this is round one. This is a multi-round fight. This case is going to progress. It's going to go to the Court of Appeals. And in the Court of Appeals, you're going to have a panel of new judges who are fresh to the case. No more Judge Mershon. New judges, they're going to look at what happened here, and justice will be served in the end. So I would say you've lost the battle. You haven't lost the war. And in the meantime, you're probably going to raise a lot of money. And in the meantime, you raise a lot of money that you can use to pay my, my <laughs> exactly. increased retainer. Exactly. And look, there, there's, I mean, we laugh about that, but there's a reality here in terms of what, what this all costs. Does this affect his other three cases? Uh, not from a legal standpoint, um, but frankly, the strain on the legal team, um, it does affect them. I mean, they've been fighting on multi fronts right now. So there's one down. They may have a little bit more energy to turn to the other ones now. Tom, how does the appeal process work just in terms of, and I think you guys both brought this up, the different judges, because this is still New York state. It's still a very liberal state. It's still a state that voted overwhelmingly 
for Joe Biden. It's it's not like there's a bunch of like federal society that's the really deep conservative. Uh, judges sitting up there on the Court of Appeals. Yeah, look, the New York appellate courts are not in the conservative vanguard. That is true. But I will say this. Look at, you know, the Harvey Weinstein case, that they can take defendants who they themselves, the judges themselves, you know, may not like one iota, but they nonetheless apply the law and they say was a fair trial conducted here. So, look, I think at the end of the day, uh, the judges are going to look at this in many respects like they look at any other case. They would look at the evidence. They would look at the rulings that the trial judge made. They would fairly consider former President Trump's arguments. And if they agree, if they agree that this was, you know, improperly rendered verdict, they will reverse it. Jen, I think about this just in terms of a timeline going forward, right? You've got sentencing July 11th. Before that, you have the debate. After that, you've got the Republican National Convention. After that, you've got a election. And those dates don't move. Is there a danger, and this I think would be a a real legal travesty, that you're going to have a conviction An election, which Donald Trump could lose based on people calling him a convicted felon, and then that conviction overturned. Well, that's an interesting political problem in some ways. Uh, But isn't it a credibility problem for the legal system? No. I actually think just the opposite. I think that if his conviction is overturned and, and keeps going up to Supreme Court or something, I think appeals the appellate process that lends a lot of credibility to the system because no matter how impassioned you are at the trial level, because that's where the passions are, then it can be overturned. Let me interrupt you real quick. I didn't realize Michael Tashara, who's been with us for 14 months or 17 months since the indictments uh, came down, is with us again tonight. Michael, do you agree um, that the appeals court will be a better venue in uh, 20 seconds for Donald Trump? Absolutely. Our appellate division, I think, is the finest in the nation. Our Court of Appeals takes cases very seriously, especially even if they don't like the defendant like Harvey Weinstein. Well, that was uh, succinct and uh, Sherman-esque. Michael, we appreciate it. Um, This continues. Sentencing continues on um, July 11th. Gentlemen, it was really great having you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, We'll write about this tomorrow in War Notes. Warnotes.com to subscribe. That is our daily newsletter. Comes out. At 4.05 p.m. Eastern, it comes out for free. And boy, uh, did it get outdated pretty quickly after the verdict came out at 4.45 uh, this afternoon. Chris Cuomo picks up our coverage from New York. I'll see you tomorrow night.